Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to the next episode of Rebel Reject Create, the video podcast all about creativity. And today my guest is Judith Germain, who is the leading authority on Maverick Leadership. She's an author, consultant, and trainer, as well as a C-suite and business mentor, and HR Zone's leadership columnist. And uh, Judith and I have known each other for a couple of years now. So I thought it'd be a good idea to have a chat to her about creativity in the context of this business world that she inhabits. So Ooh. if you're watching this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment for Jude or for myself and subscribe to the channel because this interview is a one in a series of interviews all about creativity in all sorts of different environments. So Jude, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, I remember one of our first conversations where I said to you, wow, you've got a really creative job. And you were like, but I'm not creative. <laughs> I have been thoroughly schooled by you over the years. So I now recognize that I am creative. And I think for me, it was that I see innovation and creativity differently. So I was quite happy to be seen as innovative, but I was like, I'm no artist. You know, I, I'm not creative because I don't, draw stuff <laughs> right and so what's changed why do you now think that you are creative well I have to say a lot of it is your influence David <laughs> oops <laughs> um but also I think it's the it's like my clients keep saying that's really innovative that's really creative and I'm thinking yeah I guess seeing I've, what I've learned from you is that creativity comes from either combining something that's new coming or coming up with something and to see things in a different way. Hmm. And on that definition, then I'm very creative. Right. Yeah. That's nice to hear. I think <laughs> one of the things that I'm really talking a lot about now is the fact that when you're creative, you do or make something different, you know, the whole idea of having to be unique or original is actually very problematic. You know what's so funny? Because in my own book, right, which I wrote in 2017, I talk about how mavericks use ritualized ingenuity, which is taking something from a different purpose and using. So I must have known on a subconscious level. <laughs> Creativity. Yeah. All right. So here's here's the really important question, because I mean, what you expressed in the beginning there is a very common belief that because I'm not an artist, I can't possibly call myself creative. But now you do think you are. So can you explain how you do what you do? Do you have particular methods or processes that help you to do this fusion of worlds and to join the dots in new ways to help your clients? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. And I think what I do is I use the linear analytical kind of thinking as a diagnostic tool. So when I have to create something, I will analyze it. I will look at logical flows. I will, I will dump a lot of information. So if I've got to create a new program for a client, for example, I will just read around the subject and I'll go all lateral with it. And then I'll go away and then I'll wait. And then what comes next is this emergence. So then I use emergent thinking. So I realized that I use all this logical thinking as a diagnostic tool. And then I use emergent thinking to create something new. I literally, my brain is empty and then it just emerges. Right. So <laughs> you kind of go through a process of collecting the dots and then joining them, which, which is just a translate into the way I always talk about those two things. Yeah, and I also, I think, so that's what I do when I'm designing a program or a client has stated a problem, say corporate client has stated a problem and they want something new, innovative to come out. There it goes again, innovative. <laughs> I should really start listening. But when I work with SME clients and I'm helping them to design processes, it's slightly different because I, because obviously I don't have that go away, sleep on it, come back the next day because it all happens within the session. I guess what I then see pictures. So again, I collect all the information by asking loads and loads of questions, looking for the flaws. And then rather than a blank brain 
pictures emerge and images emerge. And from those images, I start asking more questions and then it just comes to me. So, yeah, so maybe that's my quick process that I use. <laughs> But I mean, that's you're using such interesting terminology here. Images emerge. So, I mean, if you had ever actually taken drawing classes or, or something along the line, quite possibly you could actually draw these answers for your clients. It, it, do you think you could? I mean, if you if you had the technical ability? I think so, actually, because I draw it with words, because mm. I'll say, because someone will uh, say a business owner will describe they'll talk to me about what they do and I'll say, okay, what I see is this. And I will pick, draw it in words and then I'll say, well, this is your process. You've got a five-step process that does da 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 Yeah, and I, I guess being a visual thinker, I really draw that image. Um, and, then, and then I literally, as you will know, I create processes and diagrams for people to make it really simplistic because I like once it's complex to make it simplistic so then I will literally go right I see this process as a, as a circle or I see this process as this and I'll draw it out and say well there you go that's what you do with your clients off you go <laughs> <laughs> this is great I mean to translate into the sort of classical uh, terminology around creativity so you 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 practice divergent thinking massively collecting as much information in many different ways as possible and then you go through a process of kind of interrelating it to see where the flaws or the commonalities are. And then you employ convergent thinking to drill down towards a particular set of answers. Yeah. And I must admit, when I work with leaders, I try to teach them to do the same thing. But funny enough, to do that, I've designed diagrams and stuff. So it's very visual. So rather than going, da -da -da -da, I just go, see this, this is the process, follow this process, and here's another process, and this is how you connect the two together, and there's oh, your result. Jude the artist. <laughs> <laughs> it's really irritating talking to you, Dave, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> so to everyone watching this, I hope you're enjoying the conversation so far. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can see more of these kinds of uh, conversations. And uh, if you've got a question for Jude, or there's something that she said so far that really rang a bell for you, don't hesitate to put it into the comments because both Jude and I will be coming back uh, and reading those and we'll uh, definitely give you an answer if you've got a particular question in mind. So Jude, I mean, forget about me for a moment here, having, you know, it's kind of brainwashed you into thinking about, um, you know, how you do what you do as being creative. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in the past have said to you, wow, that's, that's amazing what you do. You know, the way you're able to just come up with these answers and solve problems for people, how do you do that? Um, if you had to give people only one piece of advice where they could start themselves on the road that you have been walking, what would that one piece of advice be? What's the absolute baseline important tip? I'm laughing because I know you'll be laughing when I tell you, <laughs> which is to collect as many dots, but also to make sure that you're not sticking in a narrow field. Because I think people lack imagination in their data gathering. And I think that's what makes the big difference. So if they want to become more strategic, they'll, they'll spend all their time looking at strategic planning and, and all this kind of stuff, but they're not looking at the other things that are relatable. Or you see it in uh, when people are recruiting, like for the finance sector, must have worked in the finance sector. Okay, well, we know there's a definite problem in that sector so how about going to people who haven't worked elsewhere and I think it's like if I'm designing a training program for example often you know you write a case study for them to figure out and I look for industries that are tangential to the one that they're doing because they're sort really relearning and it helps them take it out of their you know their mindset I might you know somebody might have a really complex kind of corporate and I'll go mm, that sounds a bit like retail so let's give you a retail problem to solve Wow. I mean, it's like you've read David Eagleman's book, The, uh, the Unta Unchained Species, you know, where what you're talking about there is what he calls a blend, where you take an okay. existing tool that works and does something completely different and you bend it across to fulfill a totally other function um, using the same mechanics, basically. Yeah, I think, you know what, you, you have to follow your curiosity and you have to be willing to break stuff. You need to put it all apart to see why it works and then say, what could be done to make this part better than what's working before? 
but and that then doesn't sound very business like or professional going around breaking <laughs> stuff to find out what's going on <laughs> you know what that's the only way of doing it and i think i think you i think the difference between maverick leaders and the way i look at things to conformists is that we break it in our heads so we don't have to physically go to the process and break it we find out how the process works and then through questioning we put it apart and say what about this and then we dummy run it so you know how you talk about deming cycle deming cycle you 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 dummy run it in your head does it still work no let's take this piece out does it work oh this does work okay and then you try it so then you're more likely to get an almost perfect solution straight away because you spent more time testing it um, in the sandbox before you go live with it is this possibly the biggest mistake that management and business makes like not allowing people to make mistakes it is and there's also the beauty of the plan okay so so, so for years senior managers have thought the idea of being strategic is our domain you know you could be small as strategic on the operational tactical stuff but the big picture is us so it's beautiful. They come up with a plan that's absolutely beautiful. So they don't want it really to be tested. They'd rather it be tested in the field rather than testing it beforehand. So what I see sometimes when people ask me to come in and have a look at how things are working, you listen to the plan, you ask logical questions, you test it, and then you say, this one won't work because you haven't considered X, Y, and Z. And there's almost always at least one person is resistant because I just want to try it. And it's like, but trying it's not going to work because we've already tried it in our simulation. That's a very interesting explanation for a phenomenon that I've noticed is that how um, annoying a lot of people find very creative people. Yeah. As if, as if very creative people, by doing exactly what you just said, kind of doing a mind experiment, um, are deliberately being obstructive and annoying or trying to one up me in front of my peers uh, and so on and so on. I mean, wh why would one do that if it's not to one up the person in front of their peers? <laughs> you know, and I think that's the problem because there's so many questions because it's diagnostic, but those questions are seen as challenging. So you're asking, what happens when this happens? And why are you doing it this way? Where is it going? And what was the point? And where's the end game? And tell me how that goes back to the original plan. And, and it's like, hang on a second. So when you're a consultant, it's a lot easier because you're paid to come in and answer those questions. But if you're that maverick leader inside an organization, if you don't contextualize it well, that's where the problem is because you're then seen as the challenger or the one that knows so much. And I, I know from, uh, I tend to be able to see the problem and the solution almost exactly at the same time. So I tend to not want to move forward if I've seen a problem um, in the solution. And when I was in corporate, that was a problem because I was seen as a resistor until I learned how to contextualize it and go and I say, I think if we did this rather than if you do this, it's not going to work. <laughs> right. Language is important, right? Language is very important. Yeah. Now, Jude, was there a moment where you suddenly went, oh, what I'm really good at is not so much whatever, you know, execution um, in action or what have you, but rather what I'm really good at is finding answers to difficult questions, to problem solving. Was there a moment in your career? Because, I mean, you've moved out of corporate into consulting, and I'm curious as to what motivated that change. Okay, so you have two questions there. So I'll start with the last one. What motivated the change was, because I was head of HR in lots of organizations at a very senior level. And I ended up, I used to talk about, I would train a responsible adult to run HR and I'd go play with the leadership team. And that's how I would word it. And that's what I used to do. Because um, I enjoyed the strategic change and, and the real behavioral change. And what prompted me to move out is that I would be hired to fix the HR problem before I got to play. And it just became so easy. It got to the point where, where something might have taken two years. It was taking three months because I'd be, oh, I got so good at going, oh, it's this, right. right. So I was getting bored. Um, so what prompted me to change was that I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I think most maverick leaders are best at consulting. And if they can find a great organization, they can do that intrapreneurial thing. Um, so that's what prompted me to move. I wanted to spend more time 
making big change and you can do that through my leadership principles um and your second question was was there one thing that prompted me and i think it wasn't one thing but it was a number of people saying how on earth do you do that so quickly because i thought this was normal because i'd listened to a client and then within the time so within the hour i would come up with the perfect solution and i thought that was normal so i'd come up with the oh, this is the process, this is the plan, this is what you need to do, this is not what you need to say, there you go. Off. And people would say, that's amazing. Mm. And I was like, isn't everybody doing this? Right. And then when they said no, I thought, oh, I might have something there. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So it was kind of like an, an, an external confirmation or, or explanation that what you were doing was not actually every day. Yeah, and it changed what I did it made me more comfortable to say because people were coming up to me and saying this maverick leadership stuff is great and I wasn't really selling maverick leadership I was kind of like sliding it in on the side I was almost it's embarrassing to say I was almost it was almost too out there to say just to really go go with it um and it was a client who told me I was I was an idiot basically <laughs> so i had signed a three-day training program for for the leadership team and at the end of day one he said i'm a maverick leader this is brilliant and I mean, the program hadn't even finished yet and he was like you must just tell everybody that's what you do why do you not sell this and i was like i don't know because <laughs> i'm scared or something. yeah I mean, how can you admit that as a maverick? you know what it was i think it was having still having one foot in the HR space and believing it needed to be hidden. Because that's how I did Maverick Leadership in corporate. It was by stealth. And I hadn't realized I was still holding on to that. All right. Awesome. Judith, thank you so much for making time for this conversation. It's been great having you here. It's been fantastic. Great as always talking to you. Thank you. And thank you for watching and listening to this episode. We had love to hear what you've got to say. So please use the comments section down below and drop us a note. We'll answer whatever questions you might have. Uh, and if you're watching this and you're thinking, hey, I know someone who should be interviewed for this, uh, including yourself, uh, drop me a line and tell me who they are and how to get hold of you. And uh, let's make it happen. So don't forget, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and don't miss out on the next interview coming up after this one. Judith, any last words? Stay curious, stay on the path to innovation and change. Thank you very much.